Good morning, church. It's so good to be here this morning, and um, it seems like such a long time, but we actually meet here at 4 o'clock right now, and so we get to use the building, although we don't get to see all of you. Um, I just want to share this morning um, some scripture in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 to 10. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. See, it doesn't matter what adversity we go through, God gives us the peace and knowing that everything we go through is meant to glorify God. The other verse I'd like to share is Psalms 46, 1 to 2. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. See, God is always fighting for us and with us. Um, the church that was birthed, the cord, was birthed out of um, the mental health community, and I've worked there for over 20-some years. And so I understand about anger, because we always see the after effects of anger in a lot of individuals' lives. But one of the things I want to tell you is the cord. we've been meeting since October. And I have to tell you, this year has been a journey for me. Um, I went back to school. God called me back to school. And I finished my master's degree, graduated a couple Saturdays ago. The only thing I have... <laughs> The only thing I have left is my capstone project, and um, it, that's in the process. So once that is done, I can't even believe it. It's been a journey, and it's been hard working two jobs and going to school full time. But I have to tell you that the community that God has called me to, God is really blessing us. We're seeing people grow in Christ. We're seeing people find hope in the darkness. And I walk with a lot of people who don't, who see no hope. And so um, from the beginning, we've had a lot of things that have happened. And I'm so glad that I got that schooling because God is really teaching me about being a pastor and a shepherd. Um, we have so many people that are that have gone through, through some very, very difficult times up to even this past couple weeks. And, um, and we've just seen God moving in some miraculous ways. We have a discovery Bible study and we meet on Tuesday nights and we're studying the Gospel of John. And you know, I've read the Gospel of John so many times, but God is just revealing so many new things that I never saw before. And so as we study that together, we're seeing people really learn to know what it is to be a follower of Jesus. A lot of our folks did not know, you know, we started with the Sermon on the Mount really in the beginning, and God said, hey, we've got a group of people that aren't even sure what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. So we backtracked and we looked at scripture and we started looking at what it is to be a follower of Jesus. What does that look like? So we're hoping in this coming months to start living missional in the community. We're going to be downtown um, at the Saturate the City. And also, um, we're planning a women's conference for October, so anybody here that would like to get on board with that, more the more hands, the less work, I say. And also, I'd just like to say that if there's anybody here that has a passion for the recovery community, we would certainly welcome you um, to help with our church. We lost some of our leadership, and, um, and so once my son goes back to school in um, August, I'm not going to just be preaching. I'm going to be the worship team. <laughs> and so we invite you, if you have a passion for the recovery community, you'd like to join us on this journey. I trust, I promise you, um, it'll be rewarding. Um, you'll learn a lot. And um, God is just, he's so good in the midst of it all. And um, so just let me pray for this church. Um, as we As we continue the service, just let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, we just quiet our hearts this morning before you. God, we just lift you up. And God, we know that in this life, that you walk with us on the journey through the hard times and the good times, God, but in all those times, God, we just worship you. And God, help us to see you in the, in the mental health community. Help us to... Um, Continue to have that passion. I pray for Overflow Church as they begin to move out in the park. God, we have a community that's lost without Jesus. 
God, I just pray that you give us all a passion in our hearts for those people. And God, not just to move us to be passionate for those, but God, to move in our hearts and to teach us how to truly be followers of Jesus in every sense of the word. God, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for him who dwells in us and teaches us and has compassion. And God, we just pray that as we move through this day, God, that as you indwell us, that God, that that river of love would just flow into this community in every capacity that we can make it work. I just pray, God, that you would move us as a people to be good ambassadors for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, I'm going to talk to you about marketplace multipliers. I'm going to talk to you about you and how the Holy Spirit wants to work in your life. And to do that, I'm going to take a few moments and I'm going to share with you a few of the stories that have helped my wife and I and our family to realize that God wanted to use us. Just this last weekend, we had Sam Abraham come and share about the work that he's doing. And as a young pastor, I always looked forward to, there seems to be a lot of feedback. I don't know, a lot of ringing in my ears up here, if you could change that, Steve. I remember as a young pastor, always looking forward to our missions conference. I loved having individuals come in and share about what God's doing in other places because I wanted our people to realize God's not working in just one location. God's working around our community, around our state, and around our world. And I remember on one particular occasion, we had a missionary from Southern Africa, um, Ori and Linda Lehman. They had come in and they had shared. They were third generation missionaries in Africa. And as they were telling their stories, one of our boys happened to follow them around. And as he listened to the stories, apparently he spoke to him about how his mom would take and get on their horse and they'd ride into neighboring villages and be able to share the love of Jesus. And I remember after that missionary family had left, he comes to us and said, you know, I'm going to be a cowboy missionary. And it's like, what? So I'm going to be a cowboy missionary. I'm going to ride the horse and I'm going to go tell people about Jesus and what he's done there. And so for a number of years, we were reminded of that story. It was something that didn't go away in his heart. Regularly, he would talk about being a cowboy missionary. He, when he turned 16, he wanted to go to Africa and whatever. And as a pastor, as a dad, we often talked to him about that. And my wife and I had talked and I thought, you know, it'd be kind of neat if we could take and do a sabbatical from ministry and go and maybe teach at our Bible college in Africa uh, and give, have, give him an opportunity of being in Africa, give him a taste of Africa. And so we had done that, and as he had gotten into his teenage years, he had come to us and he said, I don't know about you guys, you don't seem to be serious about going to Africa, but I am, I've already raised my money, I'm going to go with, with or without you. And so, you know, we started praying about it a little bit more serious, and I remember how we come we were taking, I was taking, going with our teenagers to a youth, con or to a, a youth conference up in Pontiac, Michigan. And I remember sitting there, the stadium was filled with teenagers. Thousands and thousands of teenagers are sitting there. And the Holy Spirit was moving in a powerful way. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, what an opportunity for our teenagers to hear the Holy Spirit speaking to their lives. And there was a part of me that was hoping that some of these teenagers from our congregation would answer the call of God on their lives and step into ministry. When all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit does begin to speak, but he's not speaking to the teenagers, which I don't think any one of them came home with any message from the Lord, but I did. And I remember sitting there, and getting this sense of the Holy Spirit, I want you to go home and I want you to go to Africa. 
I want you to go home, resign your church, and go to Africa. So I come home and thought, well, the first thing I better do is talk to my wife. If I'm going to leave my job and uproot our family, we better get on board with my wife. And so she was okay with it. And we took and spoke with each of our three boys, and they were okay with it. And then I spoke to our congregation, and then, boy, there were a lot of tears, a lot of people crying. It's like, God, you can't leave, you can't. It's like, we've got to leave. And I remember one of our young, well, he was actually our youth leader. Uh, his name is Ray, and he came to me the day that I'd actually officially resigned in front of the church. And he said, you know, he said, do you realize that you probably have preached the most powerful message today you've ever preached in, our, in your life? He said, you not just talked about doing it, but you're doing it. You're walking away from stability and you're going. And he said, it really spoke to my heart. Well, we get to Africa. We're all excited and we're loving being there and loving uh, the work. You know, we we're in the country of Swaziland. We were teaching it. I was teaching at the Bible college. And I remember something stirring in my heart. It's like, God, there's got to be more. It's like you've called me here. I love teaching, and I'm enjoying interacting with the students. But there was a sense of restlessness inside of me, and it's like, there's got to be more to what you've called me to come here to Africa to do. And, and I've always realized, when the Holy Spirit begins to stir in my heart, and there's a restlessness, then I begin, my antennas go up, and it's like, okay, Holy Spirit, what are you trying to tell me? And... It was during that time that we went and the pastor, the missionaries in Southern Africa had a missionary retreat where we come together and um, had a time to kind of recharge our batteries. And I remember sitting in this room and I looked around this room. There's about 12 to 15 people. This was for Southern Africa and it's like, this is all we've got? to reach Southern Africa. Do you realize Africa is not a country? Africa is a continent. In Africa, there are 54 countries. It's 24% of the land mass of the entire world. And I'm sitting in this room, and I'm looking around, and I'm seeing about 12 to 15 people. It was during that time that God began to Give me what I call this paradigm shift where I began to realize the message that Paul was sharing with Ephesians. Shortly after that, I had the opportunity of being invited to get involved with the Jesus Film Ministry. And I basically had the job of working with the national church. They would select pastors usually three per country. We would help them, provide them with the equipment that they needed to go out. We would get a generator. We'd get a projector. We'd get... You remember what a VHS was? We had our old video recorders, players. And I would go in and train them how to use the equipment and then share with them our philosophy of ministry. And we would go out. As I said, I began to have a paradigm shift. And let me share with you the message that Paul gave to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians 4, if you'd like to read along, verse 11. He himself, Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. You've heard us talk about the apest gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. There are five different individuals listed here. Jesus said, I have given you these five distinct offices. As a young pastor, I had gotten a call to be into ministry, and I remember starting to preach and starting to do different things in the church, going away to study at Bible college. And I had this idea that I would then be in this vocation, this career, for the rest of my life. I'm 58 and I'm still in it. But I was under the impression that ministers did the work of the ministry. God began to do a paradigm shift in my heart 
Because if you continue to read, he not only gave us the apex gifts, the apostle, the prophet, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher, but he gave us to do what? To do the work of the ministry? No. Read it again. For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And this was for me, this huge paradigm shift. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not about the evangelists doing the work of the ministry. It's not about the pastors doing the work of the ministry. It's not about the teachers doing the work of the ministry. But he has given us these distinct offices, these distinct individuals to do what? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. And this was the shift that began to occur in my heart in Africa. Because I begin to realize God's not using just the 15 individuals who are sitting in this room to reach Africa, but God is using His church, His believers, you, to do the work of the ministry. God is using you. And so I had the unique opportunity of traveling throughout southern and central Africa, training teams that go out and show the film. So we would go into a village. I remember our first visit to Zambia. We'd gone in and we'd trained the team. Drove up to the village. The first night, we had 305 people. The village itself was 300. And I remember as we were driving to the village the next night, we were stopping people. And what it was, it was the people from the village going out to tell their friends, you need to come back and see. They're showing us a movie on the life of Jesus. In the first five years, We were able to show that movie, which is basically, it's based on the Gospel of Luke in the life of Jesus. We were able to show that to one million viewers. When God releases His people, amazing things begin to happen. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Today is the day when the disciples, when the apostles gathered in the upper room. And what did they do? They waited. And they waited. And they waited. They waited for the instruction of the Holy Spirit because they were about to become marketplace multipliers. What do I mean by that? I mean that you will have the opportunity of going to places that are unique to you and you will be able to share Jesus Christ with others who are needing hope. Who's on a mission? Who's on a mission? We are on a mission to join Oh my goodness, have we forgotten this? We are on a mission to join God on His mission by by inviting people to find hope in Jesus Christ. And so, we need you to think about your daily rhythms. Today we were blessed to have Pam with us. Her daily rhythms is working with the mental health community. God has used her to touch her community. 
And so as you think about your daily rhythms, wherever you may be, whatever you may do, or even above and beyond your daily rhythms, what are your third places? You have your home, you have your business, and you have your place where you hang out, where everybody knows your name. Well, the Holy Spirit descended on the day of Pentecost, and a shift occurred. Because if you read in the Old Testament, you hear the story of Passover, where they celebrated by eating the Passover lamb, the meal, the Passover meal. Fifty days later was Pentecost, which represented the giving of the law, or essentially the place, the, the temple where the Holy Spirit was to dwell, the Holy of Holies. And when we see Jesus dying on the cross, what happened at his death? What ripped? The veil ripped from the bottom to the top, from the top to the bottom. And I remember reading that story and thinking about how God took this heavy veil and began to rip it. In essence, saying, I can now see you. I know of a, I, I've known a number of families that have had premature babies. One family in particular, their baby had to go into an incubator. They couldn't be with the baby to hold it or whatever. And to hold it, you had to put your hand in a glove and, and, and reach because you could contaminate that child. And it's fighting for its life. And I think of the tearing of the veil. It's like when that parent receives the go-ahead. It's like, I'm going in. I can see my child. And you have the tearing, the rending of this veil. And I look at this and I see how the Holy Spirit comes in. And He fills us so that we can then go and be His marketplace multipliers. There's one other story I want to share with you. Because I realize, okay, okay, Pastor Rick, you're, God's probably not going to call me to Africa. He might not call me to Asia. He may not call me to South America. He might. That's not to say that He will, but He might. But God is calling people to live sent. God is calling us to be His hands and His feet where we are. I remember as a young pastor, my very first church was 1986, May of 1986. I went in and I became the pastor for this church. It wasn't a big church, but it was my first job as a pastor. I'd been called, I'd been trained, and now here I was being a pastor. And do you remember what Eunice talked about last week? The backpack? Does anybody remember the backpack and how God gives you tools and gifts in your backpack? Well, one of the things in my backpack was basketball. I love, even to this day, I still love basketball. If you happen to drive by Jefferson Park every now and then, you may see me down here playing ball with the guys. I still enjoy it. I love it. But I remember getting out into the community and playing ball with our community teenagers and we had kind of a regular group that would come. And, you know, we'd play ball. Months went by, years went by. Continued to play ball. I didn't really think of that particularly as my ministry because my ministry was in the building, inside the four walls, taking care of the people who were coming to be there as part of the church and whatever. But God taught me a lesson in that particular story. Because I remember, you know, the day, you know, when we decided, you know, it's time to move on to another church, and several years had gone by, and I remember getting a letter in the mail. This was a number of years later, from a boy whose name was Steve. And he said, back in those days, they called me Brother Cox. Brother Cox, Brother Cox. 
And it was like, kind of shifted now to Pastor Rick, but it was like Brother Cox. He said, I just wanted to let you know and thank you for the influence that you've had on my life. And because of the influence you had on my life, I decided to give my heart to Jesus. And he said, you know, I've gotten married and we've established a Christian home. I have three children of my own. And, you know, we are now a part of a church. And, you know, we are involved in the kingdom business of building God's church. And I remember having the invitation to go back to that church for uh, they were having some kind of a homecoming or whatever. And I remember going back there and and I had he had gotten wind that I was coming back. And I remember watching the people come in with him. There was about 20 people that came in. And God spoke to me and it's like, because you got out and played ball with these teenagers. God spoke to him and changed his life. And I was fortunate that I was able to see that. A lot of times you don't get to see the benefits of how God has used you. But I look at this and I realize you have the opportunity of going where you live, of using the gifts in your backpack so that God can help you. I'm going to ask you if you would to stand with me. And I want you to face the door you think you're going to exit by. All right, just turn around and... and Look towards the exit. And I'm going to say to you what Jesus said to his disciples in John 20, 21. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. And as I say that to you, I realize that the Holy Spirit has directed my steps and has helped me to interact with a number of people. Because I'm on a mission to join God on His mission by inviting people to find hope in Jesus. I want you to envision yourself walking out that door this morning, being sent as marketplace multipliers, because you're going to where you have your daily rhythms. You're going to your third places. You're going to be used by the Holy Spirit to be His witnesses. May the Holy Spirit come and fill us. You can turn around. Do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? We are here to equip and enable you this isn't about being a spectator sport. If you want to be a spectator, go to the NFL game. Go to the Pirates game. Should we even say Eagles around here? I might get myself in trouble if I keep doing I go from preaching to meddling there. Um, but you know what I'm saying? Because so many times we've looked at the church as a spectator sport. We come and we set and we do our part. We give. We help by volunteering. It's like, no, 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 no. God has given us these five gifts. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the shepherd, the teacher. He has given us these five gifts not to do the work of the ministry, but to equip and enable each and every one of you so that you can do the work of the ministry. Amen? As the Father has sent me, so send I you.